So when I was growing up and, and first got into football, the only way that I had to keep in touch with my team, because they weren't one of the bigger teams, was via a local newspaper. This is Miles Jacobson, studio director at Sports Interactive. When he says keep in touch with his team, he means as a fan. If a football match or a soccer game, as we might say in the US of A, was played on Tuesday night, then Miles had to wait until Friday night for the newspaper to print the details of the game. There would be a match report from a journalist who would talk about it, and there would be no data in there at all. Or alternatively, I could call a phone line that would charge me one pound a minute to listen to all of the scores coming through. There wasn't a lot of information to go on, but it wasn't just the situation for fans. It was the same for the coaching staff and managers of the professional soccer teams too. They also wanted to know about how other teams were doing to scout their opponents or to inform their own player recruitment. But at the time, teams had to make their bets using taste and personal trust and with limited data from the occasional TV broadcast, newspaper report, or an in-person scouting trip. The front offices of most soccer clubs had to make huge decisions based on the limited knowledge of a few select experts who, to put it plainly, were mostly going with their gut. In the 90s, no football clubs were using data. They thought all data was funny. You can't learn anything from data. Okay, wait. So what does Miles do? Does he manage soccer players? Well, yes, but not real ones. His company, Sports Interactive, is a video game company. But these days, people across the world of professional soccer know Miles, they know his company, and they know the game that Sports Interactive created, Football Manager. So it's natural that he would have a data-centered approach to the sport. Right. A few decades ago, data in soccer wasn't easily available, and even what was available wasn't being used. They were relying on notepads and a pen, and somebody standing there writing down how many shots a team have had, because that wasn't on any TV broadcast that you had at that time. Today, we're getting a look at the way data analysis and artificial intelligence have been transforming multiple industries by looking at how they've been embraced by managers in soccer. The dinosaurs that believe that data is pointless, they're not working now. Football has grown up. I'm Elise Hugh. And I'm Josh Klein. And this is Built for Change, a podcast from Accenture. So Josh, do you play soccer or do your kids play soccer? No, we don't play soccer, but I am definitely a sucker for the stats. <laughs> So I track running, I track how much I eat, I track my sleep, my heart rate, I track... Well, for a while I had RFID tags in all my clothing. Oh my so gosh. Like, yeah, love the data. As we've explored in many other episodes, tools like data analysis, automation, and cloud computing have been changing what it means to lead businesses across industries. Today, we'll be looking at predictive analytics and artificial intelligence and how they're used in the world of soccer. You know, the story of how sports like baseball evolved with smart applications of data analysis, it's pretty well known. But among professional sports, soccer has been the last holdout in some ways. So today, as we approach the biggest sporting event in the world, we're going to explore what businesses can learn from the way that using data has finally transformed professional soccer by offering teams powerful tools for forecasting outcomes. We're going to start with the game, Football Manager, and how it helped popularize the use of simulations, data modeling, and massive data sets, all of which are now essential to the success of pro sports teams around the globe. Mm -hmm. If something isn't fun, you have to look at whether it should be fun or not. For Miles and Sports Interactive, the focus of Football Manager is realism. This is a game all about simulating what it's really like to manage a soccer team. So I can't sit here and say that we always make the decision to go for fun, right? Because the people that are playing the game want a simulation. You're the manager of a soccer team and you have to lead them to success, but you don't control the players on the field. They have minds of their own. But you do make the kinds of decisions a manager would make, choosing who will run out onto the field and who will sit on the bench deciding which players to keep and which to cut from your team, and setting the overall tactics and plans for your squad. You even make decisions related to the finances of your team. Once a match starts, you watch and analyze how your players do on the field, and you make adjustments. 
Going back to the beginning, it was Football Manager's desire to build a realistic simulation that led them to start adding new columns to the spreadsheet when it came to measuring a player's abilities. In the 90s, um, when we were first releasing our games, we had more stats available than anyone else had, but it was still really limited back in 92. And we, we grew that over the years and was like, wouldn't it be interesting if we had tackles per match? And if we had shots per match, and then we could have passes per match. And then it was really ugly on screen because we didn't have any graphics and it was massively overwhelming, but the football nerds absolutely loved it. For the game to run, the team behind Football Manager needs accurate data on players in the real world. There's a lot of soccer players in the world, I'm sure you've noticed, and Football Manager wanted to be realistic, so they wanted to include as many of them as possible. That meant hiring a lot of scouts. Last count is 1,300 and something scouts in 51 countries and regions who are watching footballers week in, week out. And yes, they're collecting mountains of data. Every single player inside the game has over 100 attributes that people are rating. They give ratings out of 20 based on their opinion of what that player is. The data that's collected by this vast network of scouts is added to the engine at the heart of the game. And that's when the magic really happens. Because as we're seeing across industries, those raw numbers are the fuel for an artificial intelligence engine. Everything in the game is driven by artificial intelligence. The match simulation that we have in, in Football Manager, um, every single character on the pitch is making a decision every one quarter of a second. And sometimes they're making decisions twice in that period. So during attacking movements, defenders and strikers will both be making more decisions. But if you're playing football manager, the choices you face are more than just about the lineup of your soccer team and the tactics on the field. When we talk about the AI, we're normally talking about the match engine, but there's all that other AI in there as well. When you play the game, you also face questions from sports journalists. You negotiate contracts with lawyers. You wrestle with players' personality traits to try and create strong team chemistry. And if you play for long enough, you can have a long management career as you're hired and fired by team owners. Every aspect of the world within the game, all powered by artificial intelligence. Trying to reflect what the clubs are doing in the real world. Um, how clubs would react if they had a huge transfer budget? How managers would react? Would they go and sign 10, 10 million players? Or would they go and sign one 100 million player? As the popularity of Football Manager grew and the wealth of data included in the game grew with it, people in the real world of professional soccer started to take notice. But more than just buying copies of Football Manager, there are soccer teams who are partnering with Sports Interactive directly and pushing their data to new limits. There are some soccer clubs that we work with in a more detailed way that are using our data as the base for them setting up a, a database on top of that and, and using algorithms. There are companies set up all over the world now who are looking at the minutiae of data. We are not just a video games business. We are a football business. We are a sports business. It's now the best practice for soccer clubs to have in-house teams made up of data scientists, performance analysts, and researchers. Not to mention, there's a number of major data companies serving the soccer world focused on providing detailed statistics and analytics. And some of the things analysts are doing now is changing the way the world sees soccer. For example, in the past, players might be rated on how many goals they scored per game, and that's simple enough. But when the data set got big enough, there were opportunities to do something a little more creative. Like one stat invented by a sports analysis company in 2012 called XG. Which, for those who don't know what it is, it's expected goals. And this, uh, this is algorithms that look at the position that a striker is on the pitch when he gets the ball, and should that striker have scored or not? Should that midfielder have scored from that position? And in the kind of feedback loop that became the hallmark of football manager's relationship to the real sport, once the team at Sports Interactive brought a fresh idea in-house, they started to imagine how they could push its limits. You know, even the people that are putting together these new um, these new ways of looking at stuff, no one gets it perfect first time. And there's about seven or eight XG models out there. I was sitting there and looking, but this algorithm's wrong. 
they're just looking at the strikers. Why is the XG not taking into account defenders? We want to do a proper XG model. So we've all grown on this journey together regarding data and analytics. And it's not just the analysts. It's also the coaches who've been influenced by the game. There's a lot of very successful head coaches out there in soccer who started off on that pathway of being a head coach at a really early age. And the amount of them who turn around and tell me their championship manager and football manager stories is ridiculous. Shaped by their time playing football manager and thinking about the game in terms of its rich data set, these coaches now take their jobs with a data-heavy approach in mind. And they're sitting there on the touchline with an earpiece in, being fed data through to them on what's going on and what the data analyst has noticed for what kind of changes could be made. Um, And doing all of that stuff in real time, if you look at the attributes that we've been tracking and the attributes that we've added over the years, they are now commonplace in football. It is this endless cycle of art imitating life and life imitating art. So, Josh, have you noticed how much data analysis and automation has really changed sports for you as a spectator? I've certainly seen a ton more data available just across the board from from devices tracking players as they move around the field to stats that are being shared on social media. Yeah. As a tennis watcher, I love how much we can now see in terms of the speed of balls hit. We could always understand serves. um, But now there's so much more about like the trajectory of the ball and how close they were to the net (laughs) and where the players were when they were, you know, um, the the number of times they hit from a certain corner of the court. And there's just so much available, which is super cool. Yeah, I think it drives the participation of the fan base, right? You, You have more information to work with. So in soccer, it was video games like Football Manager that drove some of the changes that we've seen. Yeah, and the story of how data was adopted in soccer gives us a picture of what that looks like when a legacy industry experiences data transformation. Mm -hmm. But the story of data analysis in the sport doesn't just tell us about the past. It offers some instructive examples when it comes to charting a course for digital transformation in the future. I'm a big sports fan, but I am not terribly athletic. This is Andy Hickel, Accenture's global lead for advanced AI. My commitment to myself during the pandemic was to be able to get into running. Uh, My wife and I bought a treadmill. Uh, We put it out in the garage. I think it it sat there for three months. It was all too easy to say, oh, I had a tough day. I should only run three miles tonight. All right, so Andy's definitely not alone there. But eventually, his understanding of data analysis and artificial intelligence gave him a unique way of approaching the problem. Being the kind of wired the way that I am, uh, I looked at this and I said, hey, it would be great to be able to kind of take a look at all the data that the treadmill is collecting for me uh, and try to correlate that with figuring out exactly how far I should run tomorrow. That's when Andy went out and bought a couple of fitness trackers. Once he had the tools he needed to start collecting the raw data on his performance, he got to work. It really kicked off a, a real um, a real passion of mine in terms of looking at ways that I could actually quantify my performance. He started collecting data on himself and using it to understand the effects that his workouts were having on his body. Then he could feed information into an AI and generate insights into its performance, as well as recommendations for the future. It would tell him, for instance, if he wanted to keep improving his fitness without risking an injury, how many miles he should put on his legs the following day. If the data told me that I should run five, or if the data told me that I should only run one, uh, I was, you know, was happy to kind of follow his recommendations. Andy sees the same approach continuing to transform other professional sports. As we've already explored in this episode, the world of soccer's followed Sports Interactive's lead, and every action is now under the microscope and entered into the database. We've got more sensors and more activity data than ever before. We've got all this data about whether it's scouting data, you know, that comes from humans or whether it's sensor data that comes from, uh, you know, wearables or or all the other kinds of things we're tracking. You know, teams are instrumenting everything. They're from the weight rooms to how players sleep, to what they eat, uh, to the, you know, to their, their satisfaction with the meetings that they have, to their mood. We're swimming in more data than ever. All of that data is great, but the real trick is what a team does with the stats they collect. How do you take a lake of information and put it to good use? 
human coaching and scouting is still the gold standard. Uh, and so the opportunity for AI is to really kind of make sure that we're taking this data and turning it into valuable uh, insight and actually driving actions. There's a couple of pitfalls that make using data tricky. For starters, you have to be sure that the data itself actually tells you what you think it does. How do you necessarily mitigate un unintended sources of bias? How do you necessarily make sure that you're, um, you know, you're not necessarily leading future people who are going to be using that work or using that data set? Uh, leading them astray and actually baking in assumptions into the data that you necessarily didn't want to have there in the first place. But even if you know that your data is good, then the question becomes, how do you use it? The real power of artificial intelligence is to help us make decisions. Andy's world, and the world of professional soccer, gets deep into predictive analytics. Predictive analytics is any time we use AI or statistical analysis to answer the question, what might happen in the future? Uh, and so we're really trying to make predictions about unknown events from historical data uh, and compute the likelihood that something's going to occur largely based on what we've seen before. AI can actually help take a look at what's working in other places or other avenues or other domains and actually predict what's going to impact your team. If you have the right data and you have the right kind of understand the right relationships between variables, you can actually start predicting unknown or future events with some fidelity. Who will be the right player to start out as your goalkeeper? Should your team focus on defending or go all out in the attack? Predictive analytics can help the coaching staff of a team determine which choices are the most likely to lead to the outcomes that they want, scoring goals and winning games. There's a lot of excitement that AI can actually impact sports, uh, mostly in terms of player performance. Uh, we're really excited about the fact that we can actually use predictive analytics to decide everything from what tactics to employ, to what players you put on the field, to what nutrition and kind of recommendation for uh, the health of players that we actually use. Andy says the thing he's most excited about is less the individual recommendations and more the ways that AI can help soccer teams assemble strong squads of players who will function together better than they would otherwise. The exciting thing that I'm, I'm fired up about is in terms of team chemistry. One of the things we're seeing is we can actually start predicting, you know, not just players' individual moods and the kinds of things that impact their moods over time, but ultimately how they're going to get along with the other players in the, in the, in the locker room. Kind of offloading some of the kind of the, the, the skill or the talent that traditionally only bound up in coaches uh, to be able to kind of make sure that when we're putting a team together, we're not just picking the, the best athletes for the, for the team, but we're actually picking the best people who are actually going to perform together. And who's at the forefront of building these simulated worlds? Well, oftentimes it's the video game industry. We're seeing a shift in terms of the way we think about developing simulations for gaming. We can actually model multi-agent dynamics uh, in, you know, with, a, with a common function. So instead of actually having to write a whole bunch of rules to be able to figure out exactly how players should interact, we can actually model the behavior of a set of agents as, uh, you know, as a system. Uh, and ultimately get more lifelike and more realistic in, uh, interactions. Real soccer matches follow the calendar of the sport, games once or twice a week that scouts and coaches can observe and then work from. But video games are free to run simulations at almost limitless scale at any time. And what we're able to do by running it thousands and thousands of times is we're able to understand all the kinds of edge cases that might necessarily pop up, all the kinds of you know, black swan events that uh, might impact a performance. Uh, and over, you know, by looking at that thousands and thousands of kind of iterations, we're able to kind of understand uh, you know, what, what the trends are and ultimately what's, what's the, what the most likely outcomes are ultimately going to be. But AI isn't only useful to teams on game day. So some of the things that are exciting about AI right now are AI is letting us predict injury and performance. Uh, so we're looking at you know, latent variables that we might not necessarily be able to see before. So whether it's heart rate variability or what they had for breakfast or what external stressors they have on their lives. Uh, you can actually think about how those kind of those latent variables kind of impact performance. Those tools are being deployed across the healthcare industry to help specialists and hospitals provide better patient care. Healthcare has really got an expert in terms of predicting, you know, what what populations are at risk for diseases like asthma or diabetes. Uh, you know, ultimately doing things like for detecting what, uh, you know, the, the likelihood of an allergic reaction early, uh, or understanding whether side effects are going to be severe. Those same basic techniques can be able to be used to be able to predict when an injury might happen or what course of treatment might or therapy might necessarily be put in place to be able to kind of prevent it or make uh, recovery happen faster. 
These applications of AI in soccer, they're a powerful example of what it looks like when a legacy industry embraces the use of data and then calls on AI for processing that data at scale. AI is really disrupting every industry, whether it's automotive or veterinary science or sports to pharmaceuticals. There are clear parallels to the applications of AI for a sports team. I mean, it isn't just football managers who are looking for an assist in building effective teams. We're seeing you know, some of this, not just in the sporting domain, but actually in terms of just talent in HR in general. Uh, and so you know, you know, understanding uh, how do we initially make sure that pl pl not just players, but employees feel satisfied uh, and feel that they're you know, they um, have a path for fulfilling work. Uh, and ultimately, uh, we're looking at ways that we can actually use some of the kind of team chemistry to approaches that we've seen work in the, in the team sports domain to actually help us in the HR domain as well. What about other aspects of life off the field? AI has powerful applications there too, for the people who run the soccer clubs, advertise and broadcast the games, and even manage the stadiums. Understanding, you know, what kinds of fan experiences people want, how do we necessarily get them to come out to the stadium uh, and actually and spend money? Uh, and how do we tailor the experience that they ultimately have such that they can actually have the best time while they're out there with their children or, or, or with, their, with their fellow fans? How many people are actually in line for a hot dog at, at one time to actually making sure that resources are distributed or, or put in the right places in the stadium at the right time? The breakthroughs that soccer's experienced so far, they're just the beginning. Everything is changing these days. I think there's two really exciting trends that are going on. One is that we've got breakthroughs in terms of these massive models. Uh, you can call them transformer-based models or foundational models, but they're changing the game in terms of what we can actually expect from a machine learning capability. The exciting thing is that, you know, regardless of what industry you're working in, you can really kind of predict the future based on data. More and more businesses are actually transforming digitally. Uh, they're bringing their entire infrastructure online, uh, which makes the integration of data and AI assets easier. Okay, Josh, have you ever used AI or data analytics to improve your own health? I mean, rudimentary stuff. At one point, I had a continuous glucose monitor and I was tracking, you know, how glucose levels affect running times and speeds and stuff like that. But what an AI can achieve now is so impressive, and doctors are really putting it to good use, including for professional athletes. Yeah, I mean, AI is already helping to prevent injury, keep players safer, and help them recover faster when injuries happen. But it's helping soccer teams in other ways, too, that we should mention. We've talked before about the ways AI can assist in building a strong customer experience, like in a hospitality setting, remember? Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, AI can be really powerful in terms of recognizing what people want. So in a retail context, it can help put the right mix of products on the shelves. It can predict supply chain failures and even make targeted recommendations of what stuff I should actually go buy next that is also based on predictive analytics. Like if a retailer can use artificial intelligence to help them figure out what customers want during a holiday rush, yeah. it makes sense that sports teams are then going to be able to find uses for AI when it comes to other methods of fan engagement. Sure. And that is what we explored in our conversation with one of the most successful soccer clubs in the world. We are a sports team at the heart, but we are also running a business. How are we going to increase our fan base? This is Dee Kundra, Managing Director of the Americas for German soccer club Bayern Munich. And that is to go outside of the market that we kind of already are pretty well known in. We knew we had a huge potential audience here. You know, in uh, North America alone, there's potentially 100 million people who are interested in soccer. It's about building awareness of uh, soccer and why it has a place here in this market. And we always said when we, um, we first entered the market that we want to grow our fan base, we want to form mutually beneficial partnerships, and we want to help grow the sport of soccer in this country. So for fans across North America that might not follow German soccer, that included a basic introduction to the team, the players, and their history. We are one of the world's biggest sports teams, not just soccer teams, sports teams. And that's because we have an incredible history of success. We're 122 years old. And during that time period, we have won numerous t uh, national titles and numerous um, international club titles as well. You know, if you like winning and you want to really feel part of a special, special family, that's why you'd choose us. 
but it takes more than showing off a jam-packed trophy case to make someone a true fan. So Byron set out to figure out who fans were in the United States and what they were looking for. The board does everything based on data. You have to remember that we are a German club and uh, data is, uh, is a favorite in, in German culture. So we have a whole department dedicated to kind of looking at you know, all these forms of data, bringing in research, um, deciphering it um, and seeing how it kind of applies. Every year we kind of look at our fan base, we look at how they've changed in terms of, you know, how they've grown, what new members have come in, what we know about them. And Dee's data team has come back with some pretty fascinating and useful insights. And that starts with a focus on how people are encountering Bayern for the first time. How are fans actually connecting with us? And is it just, uh, is it they're just watching a game on highlights or are they watching a full game and how are we interacting with them and are, what are they buying and how much are they spending and how much time are they spending on all of our sites etc these are things that we can really kind of ramp up to understand and then it'll help us scale moving forward then byron comes to connect with fans as people what is it that a new soccer fan might find inspiring about the team in terms of potential fans, new fans, it's important to us to understand why they are fans. So for example, we know in this day and age that values are massively important to people. They want to align with teams and brands that are close to what their own values are. And as I mentioned before, Bayern Munich is a very um, successful club, but we're a very respectful club, a very dignified club. Um, We always try and do the right thing. Recent Accenture research has shown that in every industry, people are putting businesses under the microscope. They're asking, you know, can I trust you to do more than just sell a product? Can I trust you to stand up for what's right? Understanding that fans wanted a soccer club to be an expression of their values was a powerful realization for building Bayern's fan base. And growth wasn't just focused on the United States, Bayern's reaching out across the Americas. And in every case, they use data analysis to bolster their strategy. Our first biggest fan club outside of Germany is actually in Mexico. So we know that that's come about because of the German national team, etc. So we have a, a US specific one. We just launched a Brazilian one last year. And then we also have a Spanish language platform as well, which serves Latin America. So across all of these um, various social media platforms in these languages, we're tracking all the time the engagement and engagement has always been very high for us. In building out a variety of different fan experiences that allow Bayern to reach people across regions, cultures, and various levels of interest in soccer, Dee's team has a clear idea of the journey they want people to take. And it all depends on who that fan is. They might be interested in just soccer and then it's a case of, okay, well, how do I convert them into being interested in just Bayern Munich? And then how do I go from taking them from just being interested in Bayern Munich to I really follow Bayern Munich? And then how do you go from I follow Bayern Munich to I'm a, I am a fan of Bayern Munich and I'm buying a jersey and I'm, you know, committed and, you know, so it's really trying to understand where they are. And that's where the data becomes important, right? Because what is it that caught a potential fan's eye? Did they just see a game where they were blown away by a particular player on the field? Or were they attracted to the team because of the style of the team's jersey? Figuring out what draws each fan to Bayern Munich is key to keeping them engaged and offering them more of what inspired them in the first place. We did a piece of exercise with our data team who were based in um, Munich. We even got down to building profiles of, you know, these these people um, and what their interests were. So, you know, was it Jorge, who was a 10-year-old boy who was interested in playing video games on soccer? And, you know, and what were the touch points with him and, and how we were going to engage them? Byron is using a rich data set to help them connect with fans. It lets them know not just who they are, but what sorts of outreach will best connect them to the team. They're also doing the same to connect with other brands, and they're building partnerships across North America. Whenever we kind of have any activity, we always look at, okay, what are the media opportunities? What are the B2B opportunities here? And what are the fan engagement opportunities here? When we speak to partners, they have a very specific audience that they want to reach, um, which definitely in one way makes life much more easier when you're going in and you're negotiating and you're trying to attract partners. 
Do we have that audience? Do we know how to connect with them and how are we connecting with them? Come and come and see us, come and meet our folks and come and watch us play, see our players, see our fans, see how they kind of interact. Byron also puts its data to work when deciding where to bring the team to play a game in front of an American crowd. Flying the squad across the Atlantic and arranging to face off with major opponents thousands of miles from home is no small undertaking. But with the way that Dee's team collects and uses data, they weren't going in blind. We actually played in Washington, D.C., which was a sellout game, and it was incredible, incredible atmosphere. And we also played in Green Bay. It was the first soccer game there. It was in front of a, an audience of 80,000. Marshalling a data set to direct strategic planning is behind a string of successes for Dee's team that has seen the popularity of Bayern Munich grow remarkably across the United States. After being here for, I think, five years, we ended up growing from eight official fan clubs to 150 official fan clubs. We had so many fans here, they just didn't know how to connect to each other and form these fan clubs and connect with the club that they love all the way in Germany. So as fans, we love getting to watch sports, go to games or matches, or just be able to watch from home. But it really is not just the game, right? It's a hybrid industry. There's event planning, there's retail involved, there's healthcare, there's media, there's team building, and it's all rolled into one. Right, and AI can be applied at every level of the game. Forgive me, but it's a game changer. <laughs> It certainly means for more exciting competition, I hope. And it's such a clear story of the growth toward AI maturity for an entire industry. It, and it's inspiring, too, to see the ways that innovators like Sports Interactive can transform professional soccer. And we know that now teams like Bayern Munich are taking advantage of AI, not just in managing their players, but in growing every aspect of their business. To learn more about the ways that Accenture is helping clients leverage predictive AI in their businesses across industries, visit Accenture.com slash built for change. Big thanks to Accenture's Andy Hickel. And to Miles Jacobson and Dee Kundra for talking with us. Built for Change is a podcast from Accenture. More episodes are coming soon. Follow, subscribe, and if you like what you hear, leave us a review. <laughs>